As Burma's elections draw near, the country is gearing up for its first vote in 20 years. While some appear enthusiastic, others are not. I believe the way the regime has conducted itself and has rolled out the election is, is gravely disappointing. For more than half the country's population, the 7th of November will be the first time they cast a ballot. Since the start of military rule in 1962, Burma has been beset by political unrest. Observers claim the looming polls are an attempt by the junta to cement their grip on power. Two years after crushing the 1988 uprising, the junta held an election. But the results caught them by surprise. The main junta-backed party lost to a landslide victory by the National League for Democracy, led by Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi. But the winds of change in Burma didn't last. Instead of handing over power, the general spent the subsequent years locking up hundreds of NLD members, including the iconic leader. Two decades later, and Southeast Asia's once most prosperous country is now in economic and political ruin. Its chief, Senior General Than Shui, is facing calls to be investigated for war crimes. But Burma will head to the polls again. 37 parties are competing for seats in one of three parliaments, and no matter the winner, the generals have promised that a civilian government will finally take the reins. <laughs> ပါတီများပါဝင်နိုင်ငံရေးပါတီ but this pledge has been met with skepticism. Foreign journalists and observers are banned from entering around election time, and domestic media stays under a tight censorship. Much of the following footage taken inside Burma is shot illegally with hidden cameras and mobile phones. A crackdown on independent journalists is expected and media workers already make up a proportion of the nearly 2,200 political prisoners in Burma. This is something that human rights groups say blocks any chances of democratic transition. One of the real templates for the legitimacy of these elections is looking at the breakdown of all these political prisoners. Um, there's 12 that were elected in 1990 that have been in prison for a very long time. Um, that's pretty disgraceful to have 12 people who were elected 20 years ago still in prison. Um, you've got 420 or so members of the National League for Democracy, which was recently um, made illegal in the country. Um, and that was one of the main reasons that, that the National League for Democracy decided not to contest. According to the new constitution, no one convicted of a political offence can run for office. This rules out hundreds of politicians, including many of those victorious in the 1990 elections, like Aung San Suu Kyi. Analysts see it as an attempt to restrict real power following the polls to those close to the junta. Well, I think the real issue is not the elections, but the constitution. 25% of the seats in any parliament, that's not just the national parliament, but the provincial parliament, are guaranteed for serving soldiers. So the military is going to have an important role to play in any future government, any future parliament. Secondly, the president has to be someone 
who has had military experience. There's no doubt that this means that they're looking for someone uh, who has a military background, a former general who's taken off their greens, as it were. And in many ways, the Constitution actually is self-defeating because it says that the military reserves the right to have a coup if there are things that they believe uh, are not consistent with their vision. This is not a, a real people's constitution. This is a military constitution. In its near half century in power, the military regime has said that protection of a sovereign Burma is the utmost priority. This tool has been used to punish its critics inside Burma and provides the bedrock for many of the laws that govern the coming elections. It has also amassed huge wealth, largely through sales of natural resources to neighboring Thailand, Singapore and China. Instead of going to the undernourished health and education sectors, much is thought to have been stashed in private overseas bank accounts and lavished on the generals, their army and their secretive new capital, Naypyidaw. But domestic turmoil and international criticism continue to dog the regime. Kun Myin Tun was elected to parliament in the 1990 elections. He is now a refugee in Thailand. <laughs> ဒီရောက်ပေါ်ကျင်းပါတာဖြစ်တယ်ကျွန်တော်တိုင်းပြီးကောင်းစားရေးအတွက်ကျွန်တော်လူမျိုးကောင်းစားရေးအတွက်
But some members of the NLD disagreed with the decision to boycott the elections and formed a new party, the National Democratic Force. This move split Burma's pro-democracy movement. According to the NDF, however, their emergence is closely tied to the principles of the NLD. The NDF, with 163 candidates, is the strongest opposition party running. Yet it faces an almost impossible task. Already struggling against a no-vote campaign by the NLD, it will have to contend against the might of the Union Solidarity and Development Party, led by Burmese Prime Minister Dane Sain. <laughs> The USDP is fielding more than 1,100 candidates, one for each constituency in Burma. In 54 constituencies, it will face no competition at all. Steep registration fees mean that smaller parties cannot afford many candidates. In contrast, the junta-backed USDP is armed with a giant war chest and bolstered by the presence of nearly 30 retired junta officials. Many of these swapped their military uniforms for civilian wear overnight. Here is Prime Minister Thane Sein earlier this year in uniform, and here he is today. Can this retired general lead Burma to a real democracy? I believe Thane Sein is one of the most intelligent, interesting men in the Burmese military system. He's someone who would be, in any other country, a liberal. But the problem is, he's always been someone who has accepted orders from his superiors. He is someone who has not rocked the boat. He's someone who is literally scared. He runs away from journalists like myself who try to interview him at summits. He is not a courageous man. I believe that his position as chairman of the USDP is short-lived. He's a caretaker who will be replaced by Tan Shui himself. I believe Tan Shui is going to try and control the system, not by being president, but by being the head of the pro-government party. Another general that has joined the ranks of the junta-backed party is Agriculture Minister Tay U. He retired and became the Secretary General of the USDP. In a recent party broadcast, he appeared to echo the mantras of the junta delivered daily in domestic media. The USDP is also backed by wealthy business tycoons who have prospered from a recent wave of privatization across Burma. One of the largest shake-ups of Burma's economic landscape occurred only months prior to the polls. Swathes of industry were sold off to cronies of the regime. It is seen as another attempt to secure the interests of the country's elite way beyond the 7th of November. I believe the governments uh, want to make kind of uh, preemptive decisions who will be future winners and who will be future losers. These cronies are not uh, wealthy because of their economic performance. They are wealthy because of rent-seeking activities and you know, the, most of them are running for the 
USDP, the military back party. Myriad parties representing the opposition, third force and ethnic minorities. The latter make up nearly two-thirds of the parties running and represent some of the 135 ethnic groups in Burma. The Democratic Party is one of the more vocal of the opposition. It has in its ranks the three princesses, three women who are all daughters of former heads of state during Burma's brief experiment with civilian rule, which ended in 1962. But campaigning is not easy for opposition parties. In rural areas of Burma, fear of authorities is not the only problem. Many farmers here claim not to care about the upcoming elections. Another huge obstacle for the elections is the civil war. For over 50 years, ethnic groups have been fighting for autonomy in Burma's border regions. The resulting human suffering is immense. Voting has been banned in many conflict areas where the junta faces stiff competition from ethnic parties and thus has little leverage. More than 3,000 villages, home to hundreds of thousands of people, are thought to have been excluded from the elections. Added to this are the nearly half a million internally displaced people, or IDPs, in eastern Burma who cannot vote. <laughs> And then there are the millions who have fled conflict in Burma to lead a stateless existence in neighboring Thailand. Some of the refugees had been targeted as enemies of the ruling junta and were forced to escape. Jama 
Ari kai sa ne patat lu. Cuma lu cakap nak kau sa nak. Tapi ke ya? Cuma tahu ni ya. Kita dah siap. Tay Tay says she would give her life for democracy in Burma but she has no intention to vote in the coming elections. Kunmintun is another political refugee who belongs to the Pa'o ethnic group. After spending seven years in prison, he fled Burma in 2007. Burma's revealed monk community is also barred from voting. The generals are devout Buddhists, but the sight of thousands of saffron robes marching on the streets in September 2007 provided one of the most powerful acts of defiance against the junta since the 1988 uprising. It unnerved the generals, who sent in the military to crush it. To this day, nobody knows how many monks died in the crackdown. This monk managed to escape Thailand. <laughs> ตามนี้อ่ะนี่ไม่ต้องมาเนาะตามนี้อ่ะสู้ยอดตัวผิดได้ด้วยไอ้รอปีตูลูรูเต็มหน่องทาเดอสู้ยอดมาหุ่ด
there is no real democracy in Southeast Asia. Indonesia perhaps is the one exception and the Philippines is a quasi-democracy. They do not, they cannot interfere with and demand a democracy in Burma that they don't practice themselves. Even here in Thailand, the military is still playing a very important political role. So they, they are really hampered uh, if they try to exert more pressure. The only thing I would say is what is important for ASEAN is to show ASEAN and the countries of ASEAN as a model for the next 10 years in Burma. If the freedom there is in Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, even Singapore could be replicated in Burma in the next 10 years, that will make the situation for most Burmese a lot better than it is now. The generals and members of pro-junta parties appear unconcerned about international condemnation of the elections. As the government prepares the country for the looming elections, observers and participants remain divided. Some see a slim chance for change. There's certainly not going to be dramatic change but there might be a little bit. And as most people inside who are active uh, will say, any little piece of extra freedom that we can get is important to us. I see, you know, post-2010, Burma is a much more likely uh, Thailand in 1960s, 70s. Uh, there are some elections, there were some elections, and at the same time, you know, the generals are in power, and the general ran some of the businesses, and at the same time, there were, were frequent uh, military coups going on. The parliaments uh, will be interrupted sometimes by the generals. So I see very much like uh, Thailand in 1970s. 1960s. We were certainly hopeful a year ago as well that these elections would at least usher in, if not a change of government, because that may have been too much to realistically hope for, at least a foundation for significant forward movement. And, uh, and I believe the way the regime has, has uh, uh, conducted itself and has rolled out the election is, is gravely disappointing. เจ้าหนุ่มมาเนี่ยชื่อมันมาทาเลยนิทานสีนาฮะเกิดมาเลยนะโอเคแต่ก็บอกว่าเจ้าหนุ่มเนี่ยวะล่ะนิทานสีน